And part of the reason that uh, I'm here, you might have noticed on like the flyer in your church, uh, I, know, I saw some flyers that like had my picture on it, and it said the no-nonsense biblical man. And so I hope that you didn't get the impression that what that was an advertisement for was that the, there is a man out there called the no-nonsense biblical man, and he is Nate Holdridge, and now he's here. Okay. <laughs> the, the reason for that is because a few years ago, I wrote a little book called The No-Nonsense Biblical Man. I don't know if that was the best title in the world, but uh, the reason that I wrote that is because I have three daughters, and as they're growing up, uh, I just looked at young men within our fellowship and church, and I thought, what would I want a young man who comes to me eventually and says, I'd like to marry your daughter, what kind of life would I want them to be living? What basics would I want them to have down? What practices would, what would I want them to have uh, in their lives? So that's why I sat down to uh, write that. So uh, you can get that on Amazon. Just so you guys know, tomorrow that will be free on Amazon for your, uh, if you have a Kindle or you, you have an app for your Kindle. We have it set tomorrow to be free, uh, and then I also wrote a little book for new dads, so if anybody's a new dad uh, or in the first few years, you can also get that for free tomorrow for your Kindle. We just had a little snafu. It was supposed to be today, but it's gonna, they're going to make it free tomorrow, so you're welcome to buy it today if you want to, <laughs> but it'll be free tomorrow, so, and, and then it'll be yours forever um, once you download it on the free day. It's, it'll be perpetually yours, so That's enough for introduction. Here's what I want to do today. I want to uh, go through Romans 6 and pull out some of these truths uh, that are there for us and apply them to uh, our lives as men. So if you guys would just open your Bibles. And what I want to do right now, this session, we're going to, Lord willing, go through verse 11 of chapter 6. So I want to just kind of read the whole section and then uh, pray and then uh, teach through it a little bit. Uh, with you guys. So Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised, From the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 4, verse 5, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know, verse 6, that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, verse 8, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death, verse 10, he died. He died to sin once for all. But the life he lives... He lives to God. So, verse 11, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So, Father, we just come before you this morning and we want to dedicate, Lord, this day to you. We're all here believing that you have something, Lord, for us. It's a beautiful day outside. There's a lot of other things that we could be doing. But, Father, we're here. We're here in this place, and we're expectant, Lord, that the truth of your word, by the power of your spirit, will be applied to the hearts of your people. And Lord, that you have something that you want to say to us, to set us free, to experience the beautiful realities that are found here uh, in Romans chapter 6. So I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to think through these truths, and Lord, by your spirit, that you would apply them Uh, Lord, to our hearts and that you'd apply them to our minds. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. I don't know if you've ever had um, the underwater breathing dream before. I get these dreams every once in a while where 
uh, in the dream, I'm actually like I'm underwater and I'm swimming and all that. And there's one variation of this dream where I'm holding my breath because that's what you're supposed to do when you're underwater. And actually, as I'm sleeping, I'll physically be holding my breath as I'm sleeping. And then sometimes I'll actually, have you ever done this? Am I the only one? Where I'll wake up in like, I'm out of breath. Like I've been holding my breath while I've been sleeping. And then I wake up like, you know, and like, oh, you know, and like, okay, it was just a dream. I can now breathe, you know, kind of thing. But then I also have the, this version of this dream where I am holding my breath for a while while I'm sleeping. And then, and I'm actually physically holding my breath uh, as I'm sleeping. And then all of a sudden I begin to breathe because I just can't hold my breath any longer, but I don't wake up. And I'm still in my dream. I'm underwater, but I'm breathing. It's like the coolest thing. I love that dream, you know, because you're just kind of like cruising around like, I'm Aquaman, you know, and it's just like this, you know, fun experience, you know, kind of thing. For me, Romans 6, you know, sometimes it feels a lot like that kind of reality. Like there are these laws that govern me as a man. There is temptation. There are, there is sin. There are these things that are like pulling against me as a man. But what Paul announces to me and what he announces to you in Romans chapter 6 is that we are actually dead indeed to sin, but we are alive to God in Christ Jesus. Uh, That's like an element that when Paul says it, it sounds to me like on the level of underwater breathing. You know, really? I'm dead to sin? Really? I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus? Really? I'm supposed to consider myself to actually be dead to sin? And as the chapter goes on, Paul will actually describe like a slavery. You used to be enslaved to sin, he'll say. Well, so also you are to be, as a Christian man, enslaved to righteousness, an actual slave of God. So, you know, just in my mind, it's like that's a radical transformation. That's a powerful truth. And what we have here in Romans chapter 6 is Paul explaining how we go from the process of the gospel of Jesus Christ saving us, redeeming us, the blood of Jesus being shed for us and now placed upon us, going from that great position that is ours in Christ to then appropriating these incredible truths that are now ours so that we can become more and more enslaved to God and enslaved to righteousness rather than living in a slavery uh, to sin. So really what Romans 6 is about, a word that's found here in this chapter is the word sanctification. Sanctification. It's a, it's a big Christian word. It's a big Bible word. It means uh, a consecration, a being set apart, uh, the truth of the gospel being more and more realized in our everyday experience. And what I want to do today is I want to invite you to come in further and further into the life of sanctification, the pursuit of sanctification, the desire for sanctification uh, in your own life. I want to invite you into that. A few years ago, there was a friend of mine who, you know, we've been friends actually since I was just a little guy. And um, through not even like being caught or anything like that, his wife just asked him one day, like, are, do you ever struggle? Like she'd heard like a message about pornography or something like that. And she just asked, like, do you ever struggle with that? And it just was enough of an open door where he poured forth um, a lot of honesty to her. And what he did that day, it was very rough, but what he did that day is this man began to enter into a process of sanctification in his life that I've been able to watch now for a few years, and it's been absolutely powerful to see the truth of the gospel working in this man's life and to see him growing and being conformed in the image of uh, Christ Jesus. All right, so really where it all starts is with the simple question that we read uh, in verse 1. Did you see it there? Paul asked the question. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin 
that grace may abound. Now, this is one of those Bible questions that you kind of like already know the answer to while it's being asked. Like maybe, maybe for a, a few of us, like we, we read that first question, like are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And like maybe some of you are like, are we? Should we? Are we supposed to do that? Is that the good news? Like we do continue in sin so that grace might abound? Like is there a chance, you know, kind of thing. And of course we know that Paul's going to say, no, that you're not supposed to do that. That's not the way uh, that it works. But that is the question at this point in uh, this letter. Now why is this being asked? Well, part of the reason that it's being asked at this point is because in Romans 5, Paul announced that we used to be in Adam, if you're a believer, you used to be in Adam, but now you're in Christ. And when you were in Adam, you were under the law, and where the law exists, he says, where lo- the law exists, sin abounds, but grace abounds much more, is what Paul announced at the end of Romans 5. So part of this question is just, well, hey, if God's grace abounds where sin abounds, then should I continue in a life of sin so that, you know, I mean, if God's grace is like present where sin is, should I continue in sin so that God's grace can continue to abound? In other words, if my living in darkness uh, makes clearer and brighter God's bright light, then should I continue in darkness so that God's light or God's glory, God's forgiveness, God's grace uh, can be found, can be manifest Uh, in my life. That's part of the reason that this question is being asked. But another part of the reason that this question is being asked is because what Paul has done from Romans 1 through 5 is he has preached the gospel message and he has preached it hard. And when the gospel message is accurately preached, the Christian is left with a question. What should I do with sin? What's my relationship with sin? It's a legitimate question because The truth of the gospel is so radical. You know, you hear it sometimes when we preach the gospel. We want to talk about the free gift of salvation and what Christ has done and how he's done it all and there's nothing that we do and simply we believe and when we believe we receive peace with God. We receive unification with God. We receive uh, the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. We receive salvation that's apart from the law. We receive all of this as an incredible and free gift. And the question of Romans 1 through 5 is, how do I get it? And Paul is just simply saying over and over again, in fact, those first five chapters of Romans, there's nothing that he tells a Christian to do except to simply believe, to have faith to trust in what Christ has done. And when you're hearing a message that is that radical, you ask a question at the end like, is there anything I'm supposed to do? Am I supposed to even change at all? Because radical, true gospel preaching will lead to a question like this. Now, those who would then answer this question, verse 1, by saying, yeah, We should continue in sin so that God's grace can abound. We have a name for them. It's called uh, antinomianism. Uh, Nomos is uh, the word for the moral law of God. And so it means a person who says, I don't need the moral law of God to govern me or to watch over uh, my life. And there were a lot of people like that in the New Testament era. Jude found some. If you read the book of Jude, Jude writes his little letter, and he basically says, like, I wanted to write about our common salvation. You know, like Paul wrote Romans. I was hoping to write something like that, a cool book about salvation and doctrine. But I couldn't because there are people who came into the church who perverted the grace of God and turned it into License. So there were a lot of antinomians that were around inside of the early church. Now, probably not a lot of us would sit here this morning and say, oh, you know what, I think that we should continue in sin so that grace might abound. That might not be the question that we would ask, but I do think that this is a real question or a real issue that sometimes comes into the heart of God's men. Maybe the way we might say it is something like this. Grace will cover it. I'm fine. It's okay. God will forgive me. Have you ever done that? You know, maybe like realizing, like this is an area of indebtedness that I'm entering into right now. I probably shouldn't do this. 
I, pro I realize that I don't deserve this thing. It's too much money for me. It's going to put me into debt. But, you know, the Lord's gracious. The Lord's merciful. He'll forgive me. He'll watch over me. Uh, perhaps a sexual encounter or gossip or some kind of ruthless business dealing or removing ourselves from the body of Christ, from fellowship or crossing a line in the realm of alcohol and entering into drunkenness or overworking or gluttony or lack of obedience to a conviction that God has given to us. I think it's easy for us at times to dismiss that by saying, but his grace is sufficient. And I think that in that, there's a little bit of this question that's being asked. Should I continue in sin that grace would abound? Now, what Paul does next is beautiful. Because at this point, what a lot of Christians would just do is they would just pull out their finger and be like, no, you're not allowed. You're not allowed. Here's all the lines. I'm going to draw them for you. You're not allowed. Like years ago in Monterey, we have this cool little recreation trail that is right on the on the coast of you know the Pacific Ocean. It's just beautiful, and it's a like trail for running, bicycle riding, and there's signs all over the place that say no motorized vehicles. So I remember a, a time a couple of years ago, I was running. I like to run, so I was out there running. It was a beautiful day, and I look up and there's this huge man on. Basically, like it wasn't, I can't call it a motorcycle because it was like a step, it was like a scooter trying to look like a motorcycle. You know, the, you know, the kind like not quite a motorcycle, but almost totally motorized. Uh, it wasn't just a bicycle with a little like battery on it. It was a huge thing. And he is coming my direction, probably going like 30, 40 uh, miles per hour. I mean, he's just flying down this little wreck trail. And I'm thinking about, like, all the children that I've just passed. I'm thinking about my own children. And I don't know, like, something just got in me as this guy is, like, driving down. I just stopped running, and I pointed at him as he was coming. And I just, as loudly as I could, I was like, no, 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 no. And he just, like, he would not look at me. He just, like, drove right by, you know. And, I mean, I was just, I was so ticked at this guy, you know. I think a lot of us, that's like the way that we want to handle sin. Like, I just got to say no. I just got to white knuckle it. I just got to rebuke it. I just, no, 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 no. But Paul, actually, what he's going to do now for us is he's going to tell us, guys, um, I'm not just going to rebuke all this sin, but I want you to know something. It's not just saying no. I want you to realize something about who you are. And that's what we got in verse 2 to 5. So let's read that again uh, together. He says, By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So that's a lot of stuff that Paul said there. But basically, what he's saying to us as Christian men is he's saying, there's something that I want you to know about yourself. If you're a believer, if this beautiful gospel message has impacted your heart and in your life, then he says, first of all, what you need to know is, the answer to the question is, by no means. Some of your Bibles might say, certainly not, absolutely not. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to say that I should sin so that God's grace can abound. Certainly not. That's not going to be the Christian response. But then he says, how can we who died to sin live any longer in it? He pronounces not a rebuke, but a truth. He says, you as a Christian man, you have already previously, past tense, as a believer, you have already, you're not in the process of dying to sin, but you have already, in the eyes and sight of God, you have already, he says there in verse 2, you've already died to sin. How can we then, who died to sin, he says, live any longer in it? Now that probably brings up like a huge question in our minds. What does it mean 
that I as a man, as a believer, have died to sin. Does it mean that I have died to temptation? Because, I mean, I've heard some people talk about this verse, like, we've died to sin. I've heard some people talk about it in a way where at the end of it, like, everybody's bummed out because we all know that we've ex- we experience temptation. You know, like, for instance, back home, I mean, every, every community has, like, their favorite pizza joint, right? You know, like, the, the best pizza in town. Anytime I go someplace else, it's like, hey, where's the best pizza, you know, in this town? We have a little place in Monterey. It's debated, but the long-time place, it's this old, old place called Gianni's Pizza. And it's, like, just really good stuff. I've grown up on it, you know. We went there for all our, like, baseball, like, uh, trophy, you know, end-of-season award stuff, you know. Gianni's Pizza. And, you know, the analogy sometimes is used, well, if you take, it, you know, like to me, I'm very alive to Gianni's Pizza. I walk in there, I mean, like, they have this mechanism, I think, where they, like, blow the smell of the pizza, like, out of their roof into, like, the blocks surrounding it. So, you like, you're, you're, like, there, you're just thinking, like, I'll just go, like, get a salad or something. But then, like, yeah, the smell hits you, and you're, like, I'm very alive to it, right? And then I walk in, and I always go, I, the same thing happens to me every time. I see the sizes of the pizza up on the wall, extra large, large, medium, small. And, like, if my whole family's there, I know that you know, I have three little girls, and they're going to eat, like, a slice each. My wife will eat a slice, maybe a slice and a half. I realize, like, a medium will be fine, and I go in there with a plan, like a medium's fine, you know, that's good. And then I look at it, and I'm like, it's a good financial investment to get the large, and I get the large, and then I, I like, sit down, I'm like, probably, like, three pieces is good for me, you know, and then it turns into four, and then five, and then sometimes six or seven, you know, and just, like, I'm very alive to it. And sometimes the analogy is given, dead to sin, it's like, you take a dead man or a corpse and you hold up that Gianni's pizza in front of him and there's no temptation because he's dead to it. He no longer has that experience any longer. He no no longer has that desire any longer. Is that what Paul is saying to you and to me? Well, if he is, aren't you just super bummed out right now because we're alive to temptation. A beautiful woman, you know, crosses your path, and probably, if you're anything like me, you enter into prayer, like, Lord, you know, I'm not, I don't want to go into sin right now. I don't want to go into sin. I want to hold fast to my integrity. Nobody's watching, but you're watching. Lord, be be with me right now in this moment. I don't want to go into an area that I should not go into. No, we're alive to it. What does it mean, though? Something must have happened. If Paul says, as an answer, we're dead to sin. We're dead to sin. What does that, what does that mean? I mean, we, we know that he doesn't mean there's no temptation because he wouldn't have written half of what he wrote in the New Testament. So many of the times Paul has to say, like, don't do that. Don't do that. No, that's not allowed anymore. Like, you need to live like this. Like, he wouldn't have written any of those things if he's just like, when you become a Christian, you just don't sin anymore. You're just dead to it. No, we know, we're, we know it's there. But it seems that what Paul is saying is something powerful and beautiful. It's not that we can't experience temptation any longer. It's that the power of sin has now been broken in our lives. What he taught in Romans 5 is that we used to be in Adam. And when we were in Adam, we had to sin. But now that we're in Christ, we will sin at times. But the reality is we don't have to. The power of of sin, the enslaving effect of sin has now been broken in our lives because we have actually died to sin. When Adam fell and Adam sinned, he might have walked around and felt like, well, I'm alive, but he was actually a walking dead man. But we now, as Christians, we might walk around feeling at times because of sin that's there and all of that. We might feel the deadness of sin, but actually, in the sight of God, we're very much alive. We've died to sin, and we're now alive to God in Christ Jesus. So the question is, how did that happen? How did I actually die to sin? Well, that's what Paul explained in verse 3 to 5. 
You died, he says, with Jesus. When Jesus was on the cross and you believed in him, it's like you died with Christ. And then he says, you were baptized into his death. You were baptized into his burial so that you might walk in his newness of life. And when Paul says baptized, a lot of some people think that he's just talking about water baptism, but it's actually just a word that means you were immersed into. I think what he's saying here is you as a believer, if you're a believing man, when you believed, you were immersed. It's like you were so identified with Jesus that you died on the cross with him. You were buried in the grave with him. And now, if you look at the end of verse 4, what he wants for you is newness of life that is connected to the resurrection life of Jesus. So how many of you, you, like, that sounds good. Like, I'd like resurrection level kind of living with Jesus. That's a good, okay, a couple of you raised your hands. Okay, the the rest of you, you could just have what you have. But I want to have that resurrection life, that newness of life. So the way that this occurred, when did I die to sin? Well, I died to sin with Jesus on the cross in one sense, and it was appropriated by my faith uh, in uh, Christ. So the power of sin uh, has been broken. Now, I think a lot of times we understand this when it comes to guilt. My guilt before God has been dealt with, we would say. Now, the Bible teaches this and communicates this in so many ways. The Bible says in various passages that when it comes to our sins, past, present, and future, our sins are forgiven, they are cleansed, they are atoned for, they are covered, they are cast into the depths of the sea, they are removed as far as the east is from the west, they're blotted out as a thick cloud, they are cast behind God's back, and they are remembered against us no more. Praise Jesus. Amen? All right, that's the reality. These are different biblical phrases that are used to describe what God does with our sin. He deletes it from his his, uh, mind and heart and our record. Uh, Like a picture I love to use to imagine this is if you imagine like a document on your computer that has like a record of your entire life, everything you've done and everything you've ever thought, and you have that record that's there. And then you have another document next to it that's the life of Jesus. Everything that he ever did and everything he ever thought. Completely pure. No sin in there whatsoever. When you become a believer, it's like your document, you select all, you delete. Then you go to Jesus and you select all, copy, go back to your document, and you paste the life and righteousness of Jesus into your file and then hit save and like lock it too if you have a little lock button like lock it don't ever change it that's what we get in Christ Jesus that's good news okay so that's the transfer that's occurred for us but he says I'm God looks at us and he says you were united with him this is part what this is what he wants us to know when we ask the question what's my relationship with sin should I flirt with it should I experience it should I walk in it he says certainly not because of who you are who you are in Christ Jesus. You died with him, you were buried with him, and you rose from the grave with him so that you could live a new kind of life, a newness of life, a powerful kind of life that comes up and over the sin that is common to man. All right, so in verse six, he says this. This will probably be like the longest one that we do today because we're covering the biggest chunk and the big, biggest section. But he says in verse six to us, He says, we know that our old self was crucified with Jesus in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. I want you to fixate. We looked at the end of verse 4, newness of life. Notice also at the end of verse 6, no longer be enslaved to sin. We answered the question, I'd like the newness of life description. How would you like to have the no longer enslaved to sin description over your life? That's a beautiful description. Well, he mentions a process of how that occurs in our lives. What kind of newness of life is Jesus telling us or, or giving us? Well, it's the kind of newness of life that is no longer enslaved to sin. And the process is really simple. It's found there in verse 6. Step one, our old self 
crucified with Jesus. That's what we've already studied. We've already looked at. We died with Jesus. So that's step one. All right? You need to believe this, by the way. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, something radical spiritually happened inside of you. Jesus called it being born again. But you need to believe that and understand that. I was crucified with Jesus. Step number two is there in verse 6, that the body of sin, so that, why, was the, why were we crucified with Jesus? So that the body of sin must be brought to nothing. So that the body of sin would be brought to nothing. All right, so now here's where we understand what we experience. Because we're like reading these breathing underwater kind of passages. Like I'm dead, I died with Jesus on the cross, I was buried with Jesus, that I might walk in newness of life. And, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but, like, when my alarm clock goes off in the morning, I don't really feel like, you know what, I, f- I feel like I have been, I'm resurrected from the dead. No, I, when the alarm clock goes off in the morning, I feel like I am dead, you know. I, I feel weak, and when temptation comes, I don't feel, like, that newness of life, you know. I don't feel that. So where's the problem, then? If I've died with Jesus and been buried with Jesus, and have risen with Christ, then what? where's the struggle? And we see it there in verse 6. It's the body of sin. You and I are not fully glorified. In the sight of God, we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places, Ephesians 2 tells us. In God's mind, the process is complete and done. But in our experience daily, even though we have been born again, We still carry around these bodies that have tasted sin, that love sin, that are enticed to sin. And what Paul is saying here is that part of what needs to happen in our lives is that by the power of Jesus, as we're sanctified, the body of sin is brought to a place of nothingness where even though we've been crucified with Christ previously, we are continually crucifying the flesh to bring it to a state of nothingness so that the spiritual man within us is in the position of authority over the fleshy body that that exists uh, within us. The bringing of the body of sin to a state of nothingness. Uh, nothingness, okay? So this is the process, and this like process never ends as long as we are still alive, amen? The Lord is bringing us through the state of bringing the body of sin to nothingness. I remember when I was a kid, and um, we would, my family would have chicken for dinner, and it was always like a moment of shame for me, because I always felt like this thing happening where, uh, because my mom would usually, like, cook a whole chicken, like, on the bone and everything, and then, like, would be served up, and I would, I would, like, do my best as a little guy to, like, eat my chicken, but then it always got to this place where I, like, was, like, I'm done, and I, like, kind of, like, like, I'm finished, you know, I ate my chicken, and it was, like, so inevitable. I always, it felt such shame at this point, but my dad would always, like, look at my plate, and then he'd look at my chicken, and I'd say, I'm done, and he'd say, you're not done with your chicken. And I'd look there and I'd see all like this fat and like tendons and like cartilage and weird things on there. And, and he'd be like, I, look, I think I'm done. And he'd be like, you're not done. And then he, as a man, would show me how to eat chicken because he grew up in a poor family with four brothers. And I mean, like when the groceries came in the house, they just ate everything. And so like for him... He'd look at that chicken, he'd, and like his chicken, he'd eat all the like cartilage and the skin and the, like the nasty stuff. And then when he was finished, he would crack the bone open and he'd start gnawing the, the, uh, the uh, marrow out of the bone, you know? And it was like, that's how you get all the nutrients out of the chicken, you know? Like he was really into it. So I still don't do that. But I think that's a good picture of the bringing the body of sin to a state of nothingness. Like there is always more. And this is an error that I think a lot of times Christian men make. We get to a place where it's like, okay, I'm not looking at porn anymore. And we feel like we have come to a place of full sanctification in Christ Jesus. When the people in our lives are just saying like, 
I wish you'd keep growing. Praise God that you've gotten a level of victory in that area of your life. But there's more. There's more. There's more. Are you as loving as Christ is loving? Are you as gentle as Christ was gentle? Are you as bold at preaching that gospel message as Christ was bold preaching that gospel message? There's always so much further for us to go when we look in the mirror and see Christ in our process of sanctification, amen? So that's the goal, though, is to bring the body of sin to a place of nothingness so that, verse 6, step 3, we would no longer be enslaved to sin. All right, let's close out this study with verse 7 to 11. He says, For the one who has died has been set free from sin. In other words, when we're bringing the body of sin to a state of nothingness, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, as we're going through that process, we need to understand that we're not fighting to get freedom that we don't already have. We're actually fighting to appropriate the freedom that God has already given to us. That's what verse 7 means, that the one who has died has already been set free from sin. So now we want to bring the body of sin to a state of nothingness to simply experience the freedom that Christ has already won uh, for you and for uh, me. And, And what he's saying there, basically like a way to think about this is he's not like He's not saying freedom, like think about someone who was enslaved, who is then emancipated and given their freedom. That's not the kind of freedom that he's talking about. He's talking about the kind of freedom that comes through death. Someone who maybe even runs away from slavery might have hanging over their neck like, I used to be a slave. Who knows if I'll continue to be able to operate in this freedom. But if someone dies... You know, like, like, for instance, if on Monday, you know, you're like, it was a long weekend, and I'm, I'm, I feel like I maybe, maybe I caught something, but I'm feeling kind of tired, and on Monday, you call in sick, and you use a sick day at your work, you know, like, that's cool, you're free that day, but like, you know, what, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, like, eventually, your boss is going to say, like, hey, where's Larry, you know, like, it, where, where's he at, when's he coming in uh, to work? But if you die, I hope nobody does, but if you died this weekend and like on Monday your boss hears like Larry died, on Thursday he's not going to be wondering, when's Larry coming back? All right? You're dead. You're just dead. You're set free is is what Paul is saying. So we are appropriating what Christ has won for us. Here's how it worked with Jesus. Verse 8. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, verse 9, being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. In Christ Jesus. I want you to see what Paul's doing here. He says, okay, let's think about Jesus. Jesus died on the cross and he died to sin. He actually, the Bible says, became sin for us on the cross. He experienced all that wrath and judgment, came into his body. He experienced it, but he died to it. He died to sin. And then he was literally physically buried. And then he rose from the grave. And what did Jesus do after appearing for a period of 40 days? He then ascended back to the right hand of the Father. That's where he'd always been, and that's where he returned to. All right, so Jesus, what Paul is saying is, Jesus right now is completely, absolutely dead to sin. There's no, it has no pull upon him. It had an effect on him. He didn't sin, but it had an effect on him on the cross. He came under the penalty of it there on the cross. But he's not going to come under the penalty of it any longer. Actually, there's a pretty crucial theological phrase in there when he says Christ died once for all. It kind of rebuts the Catholic idea of every time we take communion, 
that Jesus is crucified and his blood is shed afresh. No, like he's done. Sin has no more influence, no more power upon him. But also, secondarily, Paul's saying, and now he's, you know, resurrected and ascended in perfect communion and fellowship with the Father. You remember Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It spoke of a brokenness and fellowship between Father and Son that had never existed previously. So, think about it like this. That's what Jesus has. Then Paul says in verse 11, so you, and he says, also. We, in other words, what Jesus has, we also have. So you also must consider yourselves, he says, dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. What does this look like practically in our lives? Well, you just think about the life that Jesus has to the Father. There is never a moment in the experience of Christ right now where he has a moment where he says to himself, you know, I feel... I just feel like I'm very distant from God. I feel like the Father and I, uh, like there's just a gap. You know, we just, I, 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 I intercede. You know, I mean, the Bible says I live to make intercession for them, and I'm interceding, and it just feels like uh, the Father just doesn't hear me, and we're not in, like, good relationship together. Jesus doesn't say things like that. Christ doesn't say things like that because he is dead to sin and alive to the Father. He's resurrected, ascended. He's there in unbroken community with the Father right now. But so, so for us, there are moments though that we would say that, right? Where we're like, it, I just feel like a distance from God. I feel very alive to sin. That's why the word that Paul uses in verse 11 is so important. He's saying, you have to consider it to be so. Some of your Bibles say you have to reckon it to be so. You have to go through the mental process when you feel alive to sin and dead to God. When you pray and you feel like, I feel like that prayer got like to the ceiling and just bounced off the ceiling and came back down. Or that moment where you feel like sin has such power over your life, you have to go through a process, Paul says, of considering, remembering who you are in Christ Jesus, and considering yourself and say, that's not who I am. I have died with Jesus, I was buried with Jesus, and I'm alive with Jesus, so that the same kind of fellowship that Christ has with the Father, I have that same kind of life before God. I am just as dead to sin, and alive to God as Jesus is. And the reason that we have to go through that considering process is because it's so counterintuitive to our experience. It's the breathing underwater of the Christian life. But as men, we have to go through this process of considering. That verse 11, we have to go through the process of considering this to be so, and I think we have to do it constantly, constantly. It might be a thousand times a day that you run through the mental exercise prayerfully of saying, God, I'm considering this to be so right now. I am feeling this temptation. I have given in to this temptation. I, I ate the fifth piece or the sixth piece or the seventh piece. Like, I went there. But I believe that positionally, I am actually dead to sin and positionally, I am actually very much alive to God. It's counterintuitive to our experience. When I, when I was in high school, maybe you can relate to this, but when I was in high school, it was always like the way we had it set up, the principal was like always, I mean, you know, you didn't want to mess with the principal of the high school, but they were always like the like friendlier than the vice principal. The vice principal was like, man, this lady, she like always had her walkie-talkie, and you just always felt like she was just going to crack you over the head with that walkie-talkie. I mean, she was like the law, you know, and had like you didn't want to go to the vice principal's office, you know, and I knew what her office was decorated like, you know, I'd been, I was there a few times, and uh, but, like you didn't want to go there, but then like 
I don't know if you ever had this experience, but I remember like a few times after graduating from high school, you know, walking, and they had like such a great strategy in my school where they, you would walk, and then they'd tell you like, we're going to give you a fake diploma, and then we'll mail you the real thing so that you don't do anything stupid at this graduation. We might not mail it to you. You're still not a graduate till you get in the mail. But like they do this whole thing, but then afterwards, I, I remember having a few moments where like in, in a store or someplace like in the community, I would meet the vice principal. Like we'd like cross paths. And at first it'd be like, well, oh, behave, you know, act, do, like, do, be, you know, do, do, I, I'm, I'm being obedient, you know, like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing anything bad. And then like you, and then you realize, oh, you no longer have power over me. You know, you don't have your walkie talkie. I've graduated. Like there's a new relationship that we now have. And like for us as believing men, what Paul is saying is that a massive part of our sanctification is that we would go through the process of believing and considering that we are dead to sin, but secondarily, that we are now alive to God in strong relationship with him. In Leviticus, just closing this out today, this message, but in Leviticus, there's this long section that deals with people who had skin conditions or leprosy. And then in Leviticus 14, there's a description of what to do when someone is cleansed of their leprosy. Like a disease that was supposed to be incurable, but like if it ever is cured in ancient Israel, this is what they were supposed to do. And it was quite a process, you know, like there was a testing and a waiting and all that. And then the leper would eventually come in to the tabernacle area and the priest he would actually do the same sacrifice a lot of similarities between uh, when a when a new priest would be ordained for the ministry same similar sacrifices blood on the uh, right earlobe and right thumb and right foot uh, big toe like every part of your body belongs to God would be communicated to the priest it's all it's all redeemed it's been purchased by God and then he would be declared clean. And he'd be allowed to like move back into the community and worship God, go to the tabernacle. I often think about how shocking that would be for one of those lepers to experience. To maybe for years be walking around with this condition that there's no hope. And then someday something happens the Messiah rolls into Galilee and you get touched by him and you're healed, you're cleansed. And now your whole life is different and changed. I'm sure there would be moments for those lepers where, you know, a little like rash starts to develop or they feel a little itch. Like I'm one of these guys when I go out into the wilderness, like I just feel like I've, I think, I imagine things, you know, I start itching myself and I'm like asking my wife like do I have a is there a tick is there do I have poison oak like I just imagine it imagine a leper being cleansed of his leprosy he's new he's changed but it's hard to believe that's why Paul is saying to you and to me you have to consider this to be so dead to sin and alive to God all right so that's who we are that's our position so the, the next two studies through Romans 6, we're going to learn how to, practically speaking, appropriate that position that's ours so that we can experience the freedom to sin. How do we bring the body of sin to a place of nothingness? That's what we're going to look at over the next two sessions, all right? So let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for helping us, and thank you for this beautiful gospel by which you've saved us, redeemed us, cleansed us, Lord, from our sin and given us this radical position in Jesus Christ. We thank you for it. We love you. And we pray that you'd help us now to walk worthy of the position that is ours in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we have a break, I think 10 minutes, 15 minutes.